solar panels and new infrastructure for hydrogen mega projects. So in our discussions with other realities of the global south, uh, visibly in the recent manifest for an eco-social energy transition from the peoples of the south, we observe, uh, uh, especially regarding energy transition, the, that in this context, we are witnessing a type of corporate energy transition mobilized from the north to the global south, visible in the continuity of an energy model with the same logic of concentration and business of the fossilist, reg of the fossilist regime in which perpetuates the practical scheme of territorial intervention typical of the predatory extractivism already known. The corporate energy transition goes beyond the business sphere since it has diverse followers such as multinational companies, states in their multiple scales, institutions and organizations which support this perspective as the fastest way to respond to the urgency of the crisis through the introduction of new, more efficient technologies. It, has, it, it is a perspective that sees the energy transition as a business opportunity, a potential, a potential for wealth accumulation and geopolitical hegemonic positioning, which seeks to ensure the control of ownership and access to energy sources materials and technologies necessary for it. I would like to make a brief presentation about lithium because in geopolitical terms, the lithium issue, as it appears in Latin America, is a privileged window to analyze this type of transition which is corporate, neo-colonial, and unsustainable. So, we know lithium is considered the master key for energy transition toward a post-fossil society. As a final product, uh, lithium batteries are energy storage and are used for the development of electric cars so necessary to get out of fossil fuel based on mo mobility. According to the Geo Geological Service from the United States, 58% of the global lithium resources and 53% of the reserves are concentrated in Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, in high Indian salt floods. This concentration has unleashed enormous pressure from international capitals and from central countries. It is a battle for control of resources as well as for, for control of knowledge in the global value chain. That is the global, global level of estimation most important country with uh, lithium reserves, and that is the triangle of the lithium, of lithium. At the end of the global value chain are all the auto giants, Toyota, BMW, Volkswagen, Audi, Nissan, General Motors, electrical firms like Vestas and Tesla, 50% of the batteries for the automotive industry are concentrated in companies in China and Japan. Up to this, the control of the extraction is also dominated by a few companies, the American Albemarle, the Chilean SQM, the North American Lyman Corporation, <coughs> Oro Cobre from Australia, and Gunther from China. From China sorry. On the one hand, lithium, lithium extraction is different from mega mega mining, since it does not involve removing tons of air and dynamite in mountains. But the main problem with lithium is that it is fundamentally water mining. Its extraction in brine requires the consumption of unsustainable amounts of water in an arid region. This puts at risk the fragile ecosystem of the desert, the wildlife, and the livelihoods of the people who live there especially indigenous communities. On the other hand, a commodity, lithium carbonate, with that added value, it's exported. There is no control of the global lithium chain from salt fats to batteries. The fact is that in Argentina, as well as in the Atacama region of Chile, due to water consumption, lithium extraction threatens to break the fragile water balance. 
It tends to dry up aquifers and water reserves in areas that are already characterized by aridity and hydric stress. It also competes for water with the agricultural and grazing activities of local indigenous communities while posing a threat to biodiversity. What is the, how do you say the resilience in, in, in English? Sorry? Force. 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 Yeah, so force. Or hands. In but, you know, in many cases, lithium extraction has advanced without social license. That is, without the agreement of the communities, without consent of the communities, especially indigenous communities. In Las Salinas Grandes, in Argentina, I, I was many times there, the eh, 33 comunidades, the 33 communities, don't want the lithium extraction in their territory. They defend a, a holistic and ancestral perspective, their relational narrative linked to the eco-territorial fights, good living, right of nature, territory, autonomy, plurinationality, that is, they focus about this resistance, and the salt uh, flood is considered by indigenous people as a living being, as a giver of life. The slogan is, water and life are worth more than lithium. Uh, you can see the slogan in the volume that was part of IOC in Tacha project by an Argentine artist, Tomás Saraceno. He has an, uh, an, 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 a new exhibition in London now, in next month, about uh, lithium. In addition, in addition, the post-fossil transition cannot be, cannot be used as an excuse for consolidating or continuing to maintain consumption models that are openly unsustainable. There is no planet that can endure lithium enough if mobility models are not changed. It is not enough to replace fossil fuel-based cars with electrical cars. It is, necess it is necessary to reduce consumption and move towards public and shared mobility models so that they become sustainable. The fact that lithium batteries, as well as uh, wind and solar projects, also requires minerals such as copper, so, 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 such as copper, zinc, among others, warns us of the need to carry out a radical, ref uh, a radical reform of the transportation system and, in general, of the consumption model. That is, in fact, there are many, many books about, about that now, no? And I, I, I quote uh, Guillaume Picron about the girl of uh, <coughs> rare earth, and obviously Jason Pickel with uh, his book Less is More. And that, what we call uh, following the Breno Ringel, the decarbonization consensus, is a process that from the change of energy sources fossil fuels to renewable energies, consolidate and deepens existing inequalities and continues with the model of commodification of nature. Moreover, it points to a decarbonization that does not entail a change in the metabolic profile of society in the patterns of production, consumption, circulation of goods, and generation of waste, but rather an intensification and exacerbation of the exploitation of natural resources within the framework of an ideology of indefinite economic growth. On the, on the other hand, this decarbonation is a process managed by corporations and oriented towards the export of commodities to the major powers, Europe, China, and United States. All this opens a new phase of environmental dispossession of the global south. People in resistance have called these false solutions, and we call that energy colonialism or green extractivism. So, to end, more or less, or to open the, concert, the conversation, we, we, we think that decarbonization is necessary, obviously, but it must point to a way to a way out of commodification and not consolidate new forms of extractivism and areas of sacrifice in the global south. We, uh, we think that energy is a right and energy democracy is a horizon for the
the sustainability of life networks. We know that no country, no country can save itself. So it's necessary to, to, to build, uh, to build, um, uh, to, to build especially uh, new blocks, uh, regional blocks, uh, and political dialogue and regional cooperation in the relation north-south, not only in the regional uh, relationship, but especially we need we need the strong participation of civil society. And finally, in geopolitical terms, we consider it essential for the North to address a process of the growth and to confront the ecological debt it owes to the peoples of the South. On the one hand, the global North must be growing in consumption, in contraction of the market sphere, but especially the dematerialization of production. As uh, Hickel said, in less is more, the degrowth is not about ecology. <coughs> Rather, it is rooted in anti-colonial principle. In the face of ecological breakdown, solidarity with the South requires degrowth in the North. End of quote. The complement of degrowth cannot be other than the payment of the ecological debt. No climate justice of social ecological transformation is possible without including reparation for this debt. Because ecological debt and external debt you know, are intrinsically linked in the, uh, in, in, the, in the countries of the South. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the debt problem and the urgent need for real solution and not just temporary and very short term relief. So finally, from the global South and especially from Latin America, we know that there are no pure transitions and that the path will not be linear. There is also no single definition of it, uh, even more so in the heat of geopolitical inequalities and the increase in the ecological debt of the global north towards the south. But there is, as Jose Carlos Mariar, the Latin American greatest Marxist, would say, a compass, a geographical map that guided us along the way that help us establish the difference between corporate and market transition and those popular and just transition. Thank you. That was great. Sorry, I was just talking to Ashley because I we had a different order of presentation, but I think I should just go next. Uh, that's okay, because yeah. uh, there's so many overlaps, and then we can go to public power in New York City and New York State, which I'm so excited about. Um, so uh, thanks for coming, everybody, and thanks for that wonderful presentation, Maristela. Um, there's going to be, as I said, like several points of contact between you know what I'm about to say and what Maristela just finished. Um, I'll hopefully add a few additional points, and then we'll we'll sort of move on to to public power here in New York State. Um, so um, I won't go over what lithium is needed for because I think Maristella already did that, right? I think that we, we basically understand that lithium is an energy transition mineral um, that is forecast to have one of the highest demand increases across the kind of periodic table of energy transition minerals, right? So there is alongside lithium, we could do analyses of nickel or cobalt, graphite, copper, there's a whole periodic table quite literally of different minerals that are needed as inputs in the supply chains for green technologies, right? And I just use the word green technology to refer to any technology that is used in the energy transition, right? But we're gonna of course question some of the specifics of those technologies, how they're deployed, who owns them, how they're governed, and that sort of thing today. Um, but that's just as, as a basic, and lithium, as many still are already said, uh, is key because right now, it is a non-substitutable element in lithium ion batteries, which are the prevailing approach to energy storage, whether in an electric vehicle, an electric bus, electric bike, or on an energy grid that functions with renewable energy. Um, so those applications, and the fact that the transportation sector in the US, for example, is the number one contributor to emissions, has an enormous carbon footprint, replacing all of those electric, or all those traditional vehicles with electric vehicles, that gives you a sense of like the scale of mining required, right? And we're gonna, I'm gonna come back to that at several points in my brief comments, 
about thinking about these demand project projections, and I'll come back, I think, to a similar place that Money Stella ended in terms of like how can demand actually be reduced, right? And so what I want to kind of have us do, and again, it's very complementary to what we just learned, is think at kind of both ends of the supply chain at once, right? What happens in the territories of Argentina or Chile and increasingly other places in the world um, is, it, is directly connected to decisions that are made in the United States and Europe and China about the shape and pace and kind of nature of their decarbonization models, right? And I, I think that you know we can. There's a lot of interesting stuff from social movements, from in some cases governments um, in the global south around how to govern landscapes differently and better. But there, but that alone is not enough. We also have to think about, as we just heard, demand that's coming from the global north, and think about those two pieces together. Um, and and I guess just to briefly reiterate before um, adding some new points, like why should we care about all this? Why should we care? about the fact that mining is projected to increase a huge amount in order to furnish these green technology supply chains. The main reason is that we know that mining is one of the most environmentally destructive sectors uh, in the earth. It's sort of you know up there with agribusiness. We can rank these different sectors. But in terms of sectors with large land footprints that are inherently destructive just because we're removing huge amounts of land in order to dig underneath them, or removing huge amounts of brine in order to evaporate it, right? So it's a very large scale kind of industrial um, socio-natural metabolism, and it is very impactful. So that's one reason to care about it. We should be alarmed when we hear forecasting agencies say that, for example, lithium supply will need to increase by 40 times, by 40 times between 2020 and 2040. You know, how many new mines is that? That's a lot of individual new mines, right? And each of those has impacts. We heard about the impacts in brine deposits in the so-called lithium triangle. There are brine deposits elsewhere in the world. There's also hard rock and clay and geothermal deposits. Lithium's a funky mineral that exists in a lot of different types of deposits. Each of those deposits and their extraction techniques have distinct environmental harms associated with them, which we could get into. There's also social harms associated with mining, right? These are very prevalent in Latin America and Africa, but they're globally the case, right? La the mining is, again, sharing this notorious kind of reputation with agribusiness, is the sector in the world with the most human rights violations, where the most land and water defenders get killed merely for peacefully defending their land or water. And Latin America always tops the list, both with mining and agribusiness, as to where the most of those defenders are killed, right? And so this is, again, a sector that we should be concerned about it rapidly scaling up especially when in many contexts, including in the United States, we don't have governance models that are adequate to the harm or social conflict that the sector poses, right? So these are just some broad comments. As I said, I'll return to how we can reduce demand, because I see that as the key way to reduce the harm, in addition to better governance um, of landscapes. Um, so briefly, let me kind of restate where lithium is currently extracted. So Maristella showed a list of the top reserves in the world which is related to the list of extraction, but a little bit different, because some of those reserves are thus far not fully developed yet, right? And so in terms of where it's currently extracted, the number one place is Australia, then Chile, then Argentina, except Argentina might displace Chile for second place soon, because it's growing very rapidly in Argentina. And then the fourth is China, but China is for its own internal market, it's not an exporter. So the three main exporting countries are Australia, Chile, and Argentina. Um, that's a very concentrated map of, of, of production, but that's also in the process of shifting a bit right now. Um, the, the sort of map of extraction will shift, I think, potentially dramatically over the next five or 10 years. So we'll see, because mines take a long time to get built, partly again, because they're so socially conflictual. But regardless, the United States government, the European Union, and also European member state governments, and the Canadian government, I list those as like sort of the top affluent global north kind of powers in the world, um, they are actively incentivizing mining companies to open mines within the global north, right? So um, there's a huge amount of financial giveaways, of de-risking, of direct subsidies, of loans, all sorts of financial incentives so that multinational mining companies, some of the same ones that Maristella listed that are operating in the global south, um, to open a mine in the global north in the US, right, in, 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 in Portugal, in Spain, in Germany, in the UK. These are places where there are projects being explored. Um, and you know, why is this happening? Because we know, and I will try to reiterate, because this, this is still the reality, that we, in general, there's a kind of what we might call like a 
neo-colonial global extraction regime in which a lot of the resources that are used are extracted in the global south and then they go to the global north. That is unchanged, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but there is a mutation of extraction taking place because of the geopolitical realities that, that Maristella just mentioned, where global north governments now see it in their security interest, I'm just using their language, right? Their security interest to have more of the supply chains domesticated, to have supply chains within the US border. And this is all about China, right? And the sort of new Cold War dynamics and competition with China and wanting to race to dominate supply chains. And so that is producing a sort of, I don't want to say totally historically novel, because it's not, but a relatively novel in recent history shift, which is that you know for the past century, if we look at resource flows, the US and Europe have been net importers of raw materials. And they, they will probably remain that way overall, but in certain critical, in their language, strategic sectors, they want to get more and more of those minerals from mines within their territories because, again, for the security, for the securitization kind of reasons and for this geopolitical competition reasons, right? And so this is actually producing uh, a dramatic shift that when I started researching lithium in January of 2019 in Chile, I never would have predicted. Like I went to Chile because that's the, again, it was then and it still is the number two producer of lithium. And because I've always worked on extractivism in Latin America, so that was a natural place to sort of start this new project. When I was doing that, I never would have thought that today there are 120 lithium mining projects in just the western states of the US. So just in one region of the US, albeit of course a region with a lot of lithium reserves, but anyway, in just one region of the US, there's over 120 projects with some level of financial backing or who have applied for some permit. Those projects, and anyone who studied mining knows that a lot of projects fail, it's very speculative. I'm not saying there'll be 120 lithium mines in the US in, in a year, but it's a lot of projects to be proposed, and all of them are doing that because they see major financial incentives from the US government and a major kind of commitment on the part of the US government to incentivize domestic mining. Um, and so this is kind of a challenging reality to interpret because on the one hand, as we've heard and is still the case, we have a global system of extraction in which primarily raw materials come from the global south to the global north under very unjust conditions of trade, very exploitative and detrimental environmental and social conditions in the sites of extraction. At the same time, we have global north governments saying, we're gonna mine at home, right? And so what is the global justice response to that, right? One response could be, this is not my response, but I wanna value it because I think it, it comes from maybe a good place, potentially. One response could be like, this is more just. It's more just to mine in the US because then we're reversing what we just learned about from Maristella and what I'll also add you know, is, is, is called unequal ecological exchange, right? Unequal ecological exchange is an empirically verified, it's not just a theory, there's a huge amount of empirical data showing it that on the whole, natural resources and the energy, labor, and land embodied in production flow from south to north. With China being an interesting kind of liminal case that we could talk about, but mostly global south countries provide all those things to the global north. And they get the monetary surplus from it, the monetary profits from it. So that's, that's still the case. You know, and so maybe it seems just for some of that mining to happen in the global north so that we reverse this neo-colonial dynamic. And that could make sense. But you know, I think the problem gets when you get into the details. Because when you go to the details, the impacts, the maps, the communities, the landscapes that Maristela showed us in Argentina don't look as dramatically different as you might think. When you go to Nevada, and as I did, and, and you know, one could read about this online, and, and maybe folks have been um, to these parts of the US, but when you go to the ne Nevada and look at some of these lithium mining projects, they're affecting indigenous communities in Nevada who are very underserved by um, you know, economic investment, by so basic social services. They look and they will say themselves that we feel like we have more in common with indigenous communities in Latin America fighting against extraction than we do with like the Tesla owners in whatever wealthy suburb, right? And so <laughs> while I think Global South and North are very useful categories to analyze global inequality, we also know that there are inequalities within the Global North, right? There are inequalities of class, race, geography, citizenship status, indigeneity, gender, we could go on. And we see that those inequalities in the same exact way that Maddie Stella kind of ended her comments are being unfortunately reinforced in the current mode of the energy transition and we see these kind of different scales of inequality, which on the one hand is troubling, on the other hand is 
opening up new possibilities of international solidarity that I've been able to witness and have been very inspiring, where as I said, I've seen convenings of indigenous communities across the Americas, meaning including the Global North, indigenous communities in Canada and the US, kind of entering to more direct conversation with indigenous communities in Latin America and saying, we're in the struggle together. We're fighting this large copper mine or this li large lithium mine, and we all feel abandoned by our governments, right? And so that's an interesting bottom-up horizontal form of solidarity that I don't want to say it's like a silver lining to these geopolitics and, and reciting of, of extraction, but it's an interesting development that's happening that I think has some promise to it. Um, and um, and you know, I guess the last thing I'll note that kind of on this point, um, uh, before moving on to my kind of final comments, um, is that, and I made this already clear, but just to kind of underscore it, as the extractive map it expands and mutates, right, and it's doing both of those things, or it's actually doing three things. It's intensifying, it's expanding, and it's mutating, right? So it's getting more intense in the Global South places that already have been the key sites of extractivism, and it's also expanding to kind of peripheral territories within the Global North, hinterlands and like rural spaces within the Global North that, that also have kind of peripheral status. What you see happening is also interesting, which is that you see protests moving around the world, right? So. Arch, uh, I should say Chile and then Argentina are the first cases in the world, I think, please someone correct me if I'm wrong, of anti-lithium protest. So in, in Chile, I think the first protests were in 2007, and I want to say in 2010, you had the big initial upswing of protests in Argentina against lithium mining on the local level. Anyone can correct me, this is just what I've been able to figure out from research. But anyway, so let's just say in the first decade of the millennium is when you have the first instances of communities protesting lithium, right? And that's in Latin America. So they lead the way, they show the way forward of what's going to then happen later, because then over the next decade, and the one that we're currently in, as the lithium map moves around, you have protests in Nevada, Portugal, Spain, Serbia. In Serbia, a peripheral, peripheral territory in, the European, in Europe, it's not in the European Union, right? It's literally peripheral to the EU. Um, major protests erupted against Rio Tinto's mine, Rio Tinto, a company that Latin Americans know all too well. Um, and, and, and resulted in their contract being canceled, for now at least, right? So you have what I'm saying is a globally mutating lithium frontier, and alongside and in reaction to that, protests erupting in new places in the world, network with one another very consciously. And so that's a kind of interesting development that we could speak more about. Okay, so now I'll just conclude, or last sort of concluding points. I have no idea how I am on time right now. <laughs> well, I'll try to be quick. I, I think I, I was a little too wordy at the beginning. I'm going to try to be quick with this last couple points. So, you know, then this all raises the question of, like, what would a globally just energy transition look like? Maristella already posed this question, and I'm going to give a very similar answer to her, so I hope it's not repetitive, but I'll try to add a little bit. Um, you know, I, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think that we should think about supply chain justice for the energy transition at at least two nodes, probably like infinite nodes, but I'll just simplify a little bit that we have the beginning of the supply chain and the end of the supply chain. The beginning of the supply chain is mining and these nature-facing sectors of extraction and appropriation of territory and resources. And at the end of the supply chain is the consumption of these green technologies, right? In between, we have processing, manufacturing, logistics. Each of those, we can talk about what would justice look like. But I'm not. I'm going to leave those because they're not my area of expertise. But you know, I'm going to talk about the beginning and the end of the of the supply chain. And so, you know, as I said, I think that a lot can happen to make um, the governance of these landscapes. I don't want to say the governance of extraction because there are many landscapes where probably there should just be no extraction, right? So I'll just talk about landscapes and territories that they can mm -hmm. be governed much more justly, much more democratically. Um, at the beginning of the supply chain, but also ultimately we need to think about changing models of consumption at the end of the supply chain, right, and how those are connected. So, you know, I think always with governance of the territories where extraction occurs or where it might occur, um, there's an enormous role to play for environmental and indigenous movements in propose in protesting, but as the eco-social pact and manifesto show, also in proposing alternative modes of governance, right? And we actually see that this is borne out in the research that we get the best outcomes for environmental safety, for rights protection, where we have protest, right? I don't think protest is a bad thing for governance. Like, when communities get organized, they actually learn about their own rights and they pressure governments and they pressure corporations. 
And we see this time and again in Latin America, which is really on the vanguard of rights protection. As terrible and dire as the situation is in many Latin American contexts, and I don't want to downplay that, Latin America is also like a great source of hope because you have some of those innovative regimes of rights, and then you have communities that claim those rights so that they're sometimes enforced. Right? Like we don't have anything like rights of nature in the US, or we don't even have uh, consultation rights in the US, let alone consent. And there are countries in Latin America where communities have been able to win legal victories so that the rights of nature are enforced or the right to indigenous consent is enforced. It only happens through struggle, but it can occur. Um, so I think there's a lot to say about the role of civil society in governance. Um, that's one thing. Second thing is that there's interesting things happening at the national level, and I don't want to overstate anything optimistic here. President Boric of Chile announced that he wants to nationalize lithium. Now we can say, does he really mean nationalize? No, not really, not according to a rigorous definition of that, but let's put that aside. He wants to increase the state role in the lithium sector. And there's a lot of environmentalists that are concerned about that because there's not the best history in terms of state-owned resource companies and environmental protection in Latin America, right? But I do want to say one interesting development in his announcement, which is that he promised to protect 30% of the salt flats. That might not be enough. For some militant activists and indigenous communities, they want 100% protection, right? So I don't want to, I'm not, it's not for me to say whether that's the right number. But what's important is he never would have made that announcement if there hadn't been now almost decades of struggle of protection of the salt flats and a tremendous amount of scientific research in alliance with that struggle, actually, that shows that the salt flats are not just vulnerable but worth protecting, right? And so that's interesting that he's made a twist on resource nationalism so that it has a more environmental component to it, too. So that's, that's an interesting governance idea. But as I said, we also have to think about how we consume in the global north, or maybe more broadly, how like the sort of upper middle class of the world consumes, because there's also these modes of consumption in other places in the world, but the global north is where they started and where the models of consumption are kind of exported from. And so, you know, I'll just briefly, and this is my last point, I have been, um, I had the privilege of being involved in a research project that tried to look at, is there a way to fully decarbonize the US transportation sector? because we are in favor of that, as Anisela said. We need to fully decarbonize because the climate crisis is the existential crisis of our moment. Um, is there a way to fully decarbonize the US transportation sector without the alarming amounts of mining that the World Bank, the International Energy Agency, um, et cetera, tell us need to occur? And we found that the answer is yes. And also what's important is that this study had never been done before because the kind of corporate version of the energy transition is so, in, so even a kind of ideological blinder on climate scientists and on social scientists that sometimes questions aren't even asked. And so we wanted to ask, like, is there a less resource intensive, less mining intensive way to get to fully electric renewable mobility? And it's yes. And I'll just leave you with like the, what I think is the most dramatic finding, which surprised me even um, uh, in, in how I think indicative it is that if we go to the year 2050 and we say we are fully zero emissions in our transportation sector and we compare two different scenarios. One is a worst case scenario where we maintain car dependency every, in the US, I'm just talking about. Everyone's in their individual vehicles. We have sprawl, suburban, exurban, people drive long distances. The cars get bigger and bigger. So we have electric SUVs, electric Hummers with these thousands of pounds of batteries. Um, and we don't recycle anything in terms of batteries. It's like the worst case scenario. And then we have the best case scenario where we get people into electric buses and walking and cycling. We reduce battery size. We densify our um, cities and suburbs <coughs> and we recycle as much as possible. The difference between those two scenarios is 92% in terms of how much lithium would be required to serve the US market. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that the utopian scenario is possible tomorrow. Like, I'm a political activist, like I know politics is hard. But there's a whole range between those, and the more we can push it to the best case scenario, the better, right? Um, and so I think it's useful at least to know that that range exists so that we can advocate based on data for better outcomes that do not pit climate justice against environmental and indigenous justice as the current model of energy transition, unfortunately.
four years of struggle here in New York State um, for public power. And I think it ties into uh, the comments we've been, we've been hearing for some time. Um, uh, um, because obviously we need to decarbonize quickly. We're not doing that. Um, uh, and we need to think about decarbonization also as a kind of decolonization of the atmosphere. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of a delegation of environmental justice activists from New York who went um, to uh, Cochabamba in 2010 um, to the World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Nature, um, uh, where we sort of crafted a Cochabamba protocol that has a lot of similarities with the eco-social pact, I think. Um, uh, and one of the first demands was to decarbonize the atmosphere. Um, we've not done well since then, unfortunately. In fact, New York State still only gets about 7% of its energy from uh, wind and solar, so-called modern renewables. And this, of course, is not because modern renewables are unaffordable or technically challenging. It's because of the political power of fossil fuel corporations and for-profit utilities. Uh, and of course, here in New York, we're at the uh, center of that giant octopus. The sort of modern for-profit utility was actually invented here in New York, in, in Manhattan, specifically by Thomas Edison. He came up with the model of sort of distributed uh, for-profit power. Um, that Maristella was talking about as the, now the dominant model, which the energy transition you know, might replicate in this we fight really hard. And, and so I think that's why the victory of the uh, movement for public power in New York um, this, this uh, week is, is so significant. Um, so I'm talking about the Build Public Renewables Act, which was just incorporated in the New York State budget um, as of, of Monday, basically. And I think it's a, a real milestone. Um, and what it does is to mandate the uh, public power uh, authority, the main public power authority in New York State, the New York Power Authority, or NIPA, to plan, build, and operate renewable energy projects across the state with the goal to rapidly decarbonize uh, the grid. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we won that victory um, uh, with the idea that our struggles uh, are something to learn from in other parts of the US. Um, and maybe even on a federal level, but also that we need to carry these struggles forward um, because uh, as with any victory, there are always forces looking to reverse the tide. Um, so uh, what, what, what's the history and how do we win this victory? So Public Power New York was founded in the winter of 2019 by New York City uh, DSA's Eco-Socialist Working Group. And the initial idea was to resist a, a rate hike request um, from Con Ed's, the major private utility here in New York City. Um, the first key strategy, I think, that was really important was to do research into the history of the for-profit utility. Um, and that research revealed that um, Con Ed uh, had uh, requested a number of rate hikes uh, previously and had been successful in those rate hikes. Many of them were supposed to fix some of the damage done by Hurricane Sandy. And in fact, Con Ed had not used the money that they got from the rate hikes from you know, rate payers like all of us to actually fix the infrastructure. So the infrastructure is more and more unstable. Um, and, and in fact, instead they were funneling about a billion dollars uh, uh, a year back to uh, investors. So you know, the kind of rampant inequality in the existing system became clear. Also the fact that the system that's based on uh, expansion in a way that locks in fossil fuels. In other words, the more fossil fuel infrastructure the utility puts in place, the more it can request uh, uh, rate hikes. And so there was a kind of inbuilt infrastructure to lock in this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of polluting infrastructure. Um, and all of that became very apparent in the summer of 2019, all of this inequality and corruption, um, when uh, there were a series of grid failures and purposeful shutdowns that affected working class communities of color in New York City, first and foremost. Um, uh, so that inequality, you know, the shutdown of power to communities um, in places like Brownsville um, uh, and East Brooklyn, which were already struggling to cope with uh, heat effects linked to climate change, was really clear. Um, and so uh, the public power campaign really used that history to, and, and you know, those shutdowns to mobilize um, we held a series of public uh, meetings 
and we canvassed around New York City to draw attention to this inequality, and we worked with politicians to begin crafting legislation to put forward an alternative to Con Ed, um, and we decided to use the uh, New York um, Power Authority, NIPA, as uh, an alternative, because you know it has an interesting history. It was established during the Great Depression um, when there was a lot of um, uh, disclosure concerning the price gouging behavior of the utilities, um, for-profit utilities, many of which are still the things we've been fighting. Um, uh, so that was coming out then, and FDR, when he was governor of New York, set up NIPA as an alternative. So it had an important history, and of course it's a, it's a massive public power provider. Um, so um, that meant that we had to take the campaign from one based in New York City to one that was statewide because NIPA provides power across the state. A lot of the power it currently generates actually comes from upstate. It's, it's hydro, um, which has its problems. Um, but uh, you know, nonetheless, um, uh, we, we wanted to use that sort of statewide scope of energy generation and provision as something we could think about. And of course, we were aware that we would have to work on a statewide basis to actually win, right? Because energy uh, policy is determined on a statewide level, not on uh, within New York City. So we made the decision to start a kind of statewide public power coalition that was formed in, in late 2019. Um, and we began a series of statewide um, energy events called Energy 101, trying to educate people um, uh, with some incredibly slick PowerPoints that my comrades <laughs> in the movement developed um, and you know, uh, held these sort of popular meetings to educate people about how dysfunctional the current energy system is and how a public system could better serve New Yorkers. Um, uh, we, we also work with environmental justice organizations here in the city and uh, in other parts of the city um, to shut down, um, to make sure that there's legislation, um, uh, uh, that there were elements in the legislation which we were crafting that would uh, shut down polluting peaker plants. Um, uh, those peaker plants, which are only supposed to go on at times of intense energy need, um, in fact, uh, have existed for, for decades. They're extremely polluting, and they're almost all located in communities of color. So um, the, the bill we crafted, um, the Build Public Renewables Act, um, includes a sped up timeline for closure, um, and that was one of the things that uh, was just uh, accepted um, uh, on Monday. Uh, and the last thing I'll say about our, our campaign and how we were able to win was that we had to get organized labor involved. And this was challenging. Um, uh, uh, my union, the Professional Staff Congress at the City University of New York, signed on pretty quickly. Um, that's about 30,000 people in my union, so it's pretty significant. Um, but then through PSC, we were able to get um, other unions who were affiliated with, like the New York State Teachers Union, that's, that's much bigger and is statewide rather than just being located in New York City, to sign on. Uh, we also got 1199 SEIU, um, so service sector unions signed on and um, were down with the movement. It was much harder to get the trades to sign on, um, and this has to do with the fact that the renewable energy industry um, in New York State and across much of the rest of the country is notoriously anti-union and has a very low rate of unionization. So they had real concerns um, about you know, what kind of transition this would be and, and whether it would be a just transition for labor. And I'm sure many of you know that the, whole, that the phrase just transition actually comes out of a, a, a history of labor uh, militant, militancy around the question of what's going to happen if you are shutting down uh, polluting infrastructure, um, and what's going to happen to the workers who are involved in, in working with that infrastructure. Um, so uh, the Build Public Renewables Act that, that just passed includes sort of gold standard labor language, which we co-wrote with the AFL-CIO, um, that includes prevailing wage and project labor uh, agreement provisions. Um, and it also includes a $25 million a year annual fund for an Office of Just Transition to oversee worker um, retraining in the renewable energy field. So we're going to see how all of this plays out, but you know, really important victories um, and, and uh, I think a really exemplary uh, effort which could shape ideas about Green New Deal um, and how it's rolled out uh, uh, on a federal level and also in many other places where there's similar struggles for public power unfolding. Um, for instance, in, in Washington, D.C. and um, in parts of New England, uh, there are very, very similar struggles, including where my field is from, I know. Um, so uh, all of this is really great, but as we've just heard in, in a lot of detail,
detail, we have to be very careful that the uh, way in which public power is rolled out doesn't reproduce what I would call, drawing on, on Marx, um, the kind of bad infinity of capitalism. In other words, the sort of inherent tendency for the capitalist system to inexorably grow. Um, and of course, as, as um, we've heard, I think, from all, all three of us, that's very much part of the current energy system. Um, so um, how do we prevent that happening? Um, well, um, there have been some victories that need to be seen as, seen as connected to the victory from public power um, and very much part of what we've been hearing about. Um, uh, so one of those ha uh, has to do with the passage of Local Law 97, which actually passed in 2019. And that sets carbon caps for buildings over 25,000 square feet. Um, this is really important because buildings are responsible for more than two-thirds of New York City's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and Local Law 97 would phase in carbon caps uh, beginning next year, in fact. But of course, there's serious pushback from the real estate industry and from you know, the right wing and fossil fuel interests in general. So you know, we need to continue to mobilize around uh, and in support of Local Law 97. Um, also in this year's state budget was an All Electric Buildings Act um, that has really important implications for um, electrifying uh, future construction. And again, there's going to be a lot of struggle around this. So I would say in terms of sort of decarbonizing the grid and making sure that uh, consumption of minerals um, uh, as well, of course, of, of energy in general is reduced, we have to uh, fight hard to make sure the All Electric Buildings Act is actually implemented the way we want it. And, and last of all, we need to uh, continue to fight to decarbonize our transit system. Um, we have a long way to go here. I mean, in some ways, New York City, we're quite fortunate because we have a viable public transit system. In some ways, it's kind of exemplary for, for the rest of the country. But um, of, of course, the pandemic has wounded it quite grievously. It's massively in debt. Um, but there's also good news on this front. Um, uh, Zoran Mamdani, a DSA member and um, legislator from Western Queens, uh, backed a, a campaign to support the MTA that um, led to a successful passage of legislation to um, help uh, you know, basically refund them uh, and deal cope with their debt, uh, and also to establish a number of experimental free um, bus uh, lines in the city. Of course, he was fighting for all free buses and didn't win that. So um, you know, we, have, again, have a long way to go and a lot more campaigning to do around this element of, of decarbonization. So um, you know, I, I think just thinking about these recent victories is really important because we need to you know, celebrate our victories, but also be thinking about how to be in solidarity with people in the global south and how much our, our local struggles for public power and to think of energy in, as a, a kind of energy commons that should be controlled democratically and, and justly is connected to a much broader struggle for um, decolonization of the atmospheric commons and of uh, territories all around the world. So thank you very much.
having to do with lithium in um, eastern Utah. And the what is on top of not only the the issue of First Nations rights, but the specific thing of um, landscapes that are considered sacred. And those get um, raised in places like the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which has pretty much consistently um, held up um, environmental cases, but it has no enforcement mechanism. So, and that body, which is part of the OAS, but autonomous, deals with this entire hemisphere. So I'm wondering, because that's an issue, obviously, as you said, with these um, major endeavors by New York State, how do we make sure that this happens and there isn't a pushback? Um, we're, we're using the input um, and it's a moral input, an ethical I input of um, indigenous people. And we have certainly the most important irreplaceable resource on which all life is dependent, fresh, potable water. How, does, how do we bring this in this, these elements collectively as as a core element of discussion and, and action. Okay, thank you for your question. Shall we take one more question and then the panelists mm -hmm. can field whichever they want? Somebody else? Well, I have three. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's three of you. Uh, okay. Real quickly. <clears throat> yeah, we do have to think about the planning consumption in the global world. How do you think about that in the practice? Where you can probably do it. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, the, uh, um, you talk about the argument that that's the expansion of mining in terms of social and environmental, but I also want to invite a thought about the creation of a new industrial complex. We're trying to kill the fossil fuel industrial complex, not just to create another one. And just wondering you know, about instituted social power. These are, these are ideological institutions, financial institutions, industrial combines. Um, so that's a thought there about the political part. And the, the, the invitation to Maricela is um, about rights of nature. What is the specific power or mm. force behind rights of nature in the work that, that you're doing? I just would Thea said, we don't have that here in the United States. Great, let's, let's. <laughs> so that feels to me like an opportunity to talk a little bit about what specific place rights of nature plays in your work and your practice too. Sorry for, I hope that's not. sovereignty and our relation to it. Um, you know, I have to say that the way I've been thinking about that the most of late has to do with conservation um, ideology. I just co-edited a book called Decolonized Conservation. Um, as some of you may know, um, there's a kind of coming together of the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. Um, and in fact, there, there's two sort of link um, United Nations forums. They're both called, confusingly, called the Conference of Parties, right? So there's the, the COP for climate, and then there's also a COP for biodiversity. And just last autumn um, in Montreal, COP15 for biodiversity decided um, to support the idea of expanding areas, protected areas around the world um, from currently constituting 17, 17%, 17%, 17% of the planet to 30% of the planet by 2030. So that's roughly a doubling of the amount of land in protected area status. Um, and indigenous people only have sovereignty over about 1% of the land that's in protected area status. Um, 
around the world. And so, you know, these are places essentially that are uh, a legacy of Yosemite and other national parks in the United States where, you know, you, you kick the indigenous people off the land, you declare a pristine wilderness, and you say that it's going to, you know, be nature. And, and now what's happening is that that nature is supposed to absorb carbon, right? So it's becoming the solution to the climate crisis, essentially, you know, uh, expanding protected areas is supposed to absorb carbon, and so big corporations are selling or paying for carbon offsets. So um, I think in terms of, of thinking about um, uh, indigenous sovereignty, being aware of the way that these two crises are coming together and how what seems like a very virtuous solution, let's expand areas that are conserved and protected, you know, um, we want more areas like Yosemite is actually a massive land grab. Um, and so I think being in solidarity with indigenous people to, to fight that kind of practice um, and, and that trend is really important. And that also involves just kind of getting, getting the word out. And I would think it's connected to many of the kind of struggles against extractive industries. Um, in fact, it is a form of extractivism because in, in many cases, land that's in protected area status also um, uh, is land that's accessible to concessions for timber extraction or coal mining or you know, other forms of mineral mining uh, by national governments. So I think that's where these kinds of things come together. Um, and in, in terms of your question about my practice, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of that book that I just co-edited because um, uh, I saw online this kind of counter summit, which my comrades in Survival International put together in Marseille and was totally bowled over by what people were saying there um, uh, and offered to um, transcribe all of the talks. Um, and it was a lot of work, but I think it's produced a, a really great volume. So uh, I'm not sure that significantly <laughs> decarbonized my, my own life, but I think, you know, in terms of thinking about how concretely to be in solidarity and to push back against these uh, really dangerous trends in, you know, the global um, economy and the way that capitalism is sort of scaling up forms of extraction, that is what I would say um, I'm most proud of. Because they don't have a natural 
resources. And they consume more or less 20% of resources of the, of, in the world, but they have 3%. It's not the same for the United States. It's not the same for China. China has more or less 63% of the rare, uh, rare earth. So they don't need no one for, uh, for uh, uh, build uh, the, the, the energy transition, you know? And, uh, and not, uh, not only energy transition, digital transition is important too. So it's a very interesting moment. And even Europe uh, study, for example, this uh, kind of uh, transformation in the global map. Because in fact, now, natural resources are not in the bigger list. And in the South, especially. In the South, in the South, in China, uh, even. So, it's very, very, I think, uh, complicated with this uh, mixture uh, between uh, uh, energy transition and, uh, and, how to say, energy security, too. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, I don't know, but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to, to, to study the, 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 the orientations and especially the, the contradictions now. Um, but, for example, in Europe, uh, there are a lot of people that talk, and even in uh, the, 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 the European Union, talk about the growth. And it's not the, the, the topic uh, here in the United States. No one talk about there is, a, there is a, I don't know, but uh, I think that there are no, uh, there, there is not a, a book about this topic with this title, the growth. And in Europe, there are many, 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 many books, and uh, there is an interest in even there's yeah. one book. Oh, yeah, a futuristy growth. It just came out, but I, I don't know if wow. I call it American because the author, but Verso, it was like, it was sold a lot in America, but it's still <laughs> something like France. It's the exception to Verso. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, but uh, in Latin America, it's very difficult yeah. to talk about the growth, but uh, we it's know, he said, yes, yeah, for different yeah. reasons, exactly, you know? It's not, it's not a book, but you have something about the baby steps. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so I, I, I find uh, very interesting the, the, um, this report about uh, uh, about uh, lithium reduction uh, in the use of uh, uh, the system of transport. That uh, because it's, 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 it's a trade or it's an exercise, a very good exercise to think in reducing consum consumption too. Okay, but uh, in the project, for example, in in the new energy project here in New York, I, I don't see that. So uh, there is a decarbonization, uh, oh, it's about decarbonization, but not about without re reducing the consumption. And uh, I know it's not a question of the public transport because it's a more, more or less a fixed uh, the, the question of transport. But there is not this, mm. this uh, concern about no? This, uh, this question about uh, the role. It, it, that, uh, for me, it's a very important uh, uh, topic. And last point, yes, rest of nature. For me, it's a very important topic. Uh, it's not only a topic, it's a practice. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, especially in the struggles, in the social movement, in uh, women uh, fight, in the uh, eco-territorial fight, I talked about that, uh, Ashley was there. Mm -hmm. huh? Because I think that we need to change uh, our relationship with nature. We need to adopt a relational paradigm. A right of nature is associated with a uh, non-binary paradigm and another uh, relationship, uh, interdependence and reciprocity with nature. It's not only discourse. It's, it's not only imaginary. It's practices, practices of resilience in this paradigm. So I think that is, is, is right of nature and eco territorial feminism in the South is a possibility to uh, uh, to wake up for a wake up you know for a cognitive liberation in order to uh, to, to, to build another uh, political horizon. I, I think I think that is important. So I want to say maybe one really brief thing I'm going to answer for you a little bit, if you don't mind, about this point about public power and resources.
those views. So I think you're right that in the public power campaign, the central question is about ownership. It's like who owns the means of energy production? And it's about trying to increase the role of the public sector, ideally with democratic governance. That piece did not fully make it in there, is my understanding, but that's just like the next goal. I mean, meaning, so the original public power campaign had an important element that didn't get codified, but maybe in the next round will, which is to also democratically govern the energy system and have it be publicly owned. So the public ownership part is now more strengthened. The democratic part is like, we need to fight, well, we, I don't live here, but uh, they need to fight more for. Um, but but you know, how does this relate to resource use and consumption and land pr footprint? I don't think it's explicit. Like there's not a degrowth or, or, or uh, reduce material intensity kind of, to my knowledge, that wasn't like explicitly messaged in the campaign. But I, I, we do know, and this relates to something Ashley said earlier, that the system of privately owned, investor owned utilities are really inefficient in their land footprints and resource uses, partly because the way that they make money, the, the only way they're allowed to raise rates on customers is if they're building new infrastructure. And a lot of the time, as you said, that infrastructure is maybe not necessary, it's definitely polluting if it's fossil fuels, but there's a built-in mechanism for like growth of the energy system in the private system. And that mechanism doesn't pertain to the publicly owned system. So there's at least the possibility that you could have a more resource efficient energy system under public and democratic ownership. I don't, I don't know that that's explicitly messaged, but it's, you know, we could talk, I mean, it's like opened up as a possibility. Anyway, sorry, just throw that in there. But, I know I can answer your question, but I don't understand it actually. Industrial complex, are you asking about like what is investment and industrial development look like in these supply chains right now? Or what was your question? No, the extension okay. of mining is that environment. Yeah. That the people. Yeah. That the politics. Yeah. That's the argument. And it's, okay. what that means is that it's also space of resistance. Yeah. Correct. But what what is the question that I should answer? Or is it just a comment? Both comments. <laughs> okay. But but no, but here's why. Um, uh, I see that as one of the big detonators of service, for example. Yeah. Who the fuck are these people telling us what to do, right? And, okay, yeah. and adding to corruption mm -hmm. and deepening a political crisis. Yeah. Because the pointy edge of the stick may show up as environment, may show up as social, often shows up as politics. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that like the thing, uh, so let me see if this responds to that point. Definitely true that in Serbia, which I mentioned, had these massive protests that spread to the whole country really against the Rio Tinto lithium project. Um, there were a lot of multifaceted demands. There were environmental concerns, a lot of which had nothing to do with the lithium project, but they shaped people's response to it, right? Like there's Serbia, I think, has the highest levels of like pollution in the Europe. In Europe, I should not keep saying European Union; it's not European Union. But in Europe, it's like heavily polluted. There's a lot of extractive industries and just polluting energy infrastructure. And so, people already had a lot of environmental grievances, and then they felt, oh, now we're going to be the sacrifice zone for the European supply chains, also. And so they that pissed them off. There was a lot of, of course, discontent with the government for a number of issues that are not related to this, but. It, it became, I mean, it was actually so multifaceted that I think that there was definitely some right-wing populace that jumped on the bandwagon of opposing this lithium mine. I mean, it wasn't just a purely left-wing opposition, though I, it skewed that way, but the, my understanding from people there. But, um, but yeah, I think that's the thing about mining is that there are so many different types of problems that it can cause in the environmental, social, and political economy realms that the types of activism and labor, let me not forget about that, right? It's a historically a site of militant labor activism and it continues to be one, but you know, the, some of the first, I think most interesting mining protests were like just labor strikes that were, you know, for health and safety reasons and, and that's all over the world, South Africa, I mean, you know, wherever, so all sorts of places. But point being, there's so many different problems that it can cause and does cause under current conditions that you get a, an array of grievances. Under the best case scenario, or maybe Serbia as an example, and there are many Latin American examples of this too, you get a very broad, wide-ranging movement, right? You know, sometimes it works out differently where these grievances are become divisions, and that is often mining companies play a role in exacerbating that, right? So you might have some communities that have, or members of a community, let's say, that have more economic concerns or other that are more environmental, and you know, if there's not, an, 
mo social movement that's stitching those together, these can become counterposed. And there are some people that are more concerned about whether the jobs are good versus other people about the pollution and contamination versus others about the corruption. So I think it can work out different ways. But, um, but I don't know if this is addressing what you're saying. Um, but I think it's absolutely interesting that you get a lot of different types of um, grievances and complaints about mining that then under some conditions become social movements and then under, I think, best case scenarios become very multifaceted social movements that address multiple of those. Um, but, you know, again, just to end this, and I you know the story well and Mani Stella knows it very well, that like also you get clashes of different visions out of that, right? Like, you know, I mentioned resource nationalism and Boric and the nationalization plans in Chile. And that's like one approach to kind of deal with the problems and injustices of mining is to say, well, the Global South government should have more of a role and we should uh, limit what corporations can do and, and like, you know, create a state-owned company. But if you're an indigenous community fighting against extraction, like that's not a solution per se, because then you just have a state-owned company instead of a multinational company. I'm not, I don't want, I'm not trying to myself say that those are mutually inherently opposed, but they've become opposed in politics, right? In Latin America, at least, obviously. So it can work out different ways, but it's fascinating. I mean, and, and you know, and I think like, again, the strongest movements address multiple, tend to speak to multiple concerns at the same time. And urban rural, like, like go beyond also, like have actually urban, aren't, you know, there, there's interesting struggles that go beyond just the, the only rural peripheries where also urban working class people get involved, you know, so that's kind of another interesting axis of, of um, uh, constituencies. So. I don't know if you want to speak to any of that. Um, well, I'll just add a couple of things very quickly in terms of the question about degrowth. Um, it, you're correct, it wasn't um, highlighted in the campaign for public power. Um, mm -hmm. uh, originally, the Constitution of Public Power Authority um, was in one bill, and then the kind of de democratization elements were in another. Um, and we tried to sort of put some elements in what passed, and, and as Thea correctly said, that was the one part that uh, you know the, the governor and uh, people in power wanted to gut for fairly obvious reasons, you know. Um, but the struggle's not over. The, the next big thing we need to do is um, we're, we're running a dump Driscoll campaign. Um, Justin Driscoll is the kind of corporate connected lawyer who's the interim CEO of NIPA, the, the Public Power Authority. And he's on record last summer saying NIPA can't do an energy transition. So <laughs> if he really believes that, we need to, you know, he needs to exit stage right. So you know, we, we have to campaign to get him out. And, and then we really want to push on this democratization issue. And, one of the things we've been thinking about is having a kind of observatory modeled on the, the Paris Water Observatory that would be somewhat autonomous and would produce reports about the functioning of the system. And so, you know, I would think that degrowth and you know efficiency and diminishing resource consumption would be really an important element of that, and that the observatory would be pushing that. Um, and just the other quick observation. While I think you're right, sort of deep growth discourse is not as common as you would wish it to be here in the US. Um, I was in the room when the Eco-Socialist Working Group took a vote on the campaign that eventually became the Public Power Campaign. And the other major campaign we were discussing was a campaign for free public uh, transit in New York City. And that was clearly you know, very much animated, not just by the you know, uh, clear inequalities of, of uh, the MTA and, and its struggles, but also by the sense that this is the way we can diminish carbon emissions in the city, right? So, um, you know, I, I think even if we weren't foregrounding these elements in the, the struggle for public power, they're very much in people's minds and are, are going to come back moving forward. And, and are there in Zora Mandani's campaign for the MTA. Mm -hmm. um, should we take some more questions? I'm not sure what time it is. Yeah. We have yeah, time we for like five, seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, a, another quick yeah. lightning round of questions and responses, yes. Very quick, more of a comment, sorry. I, I want to push back a, a little on the idea that degrowth is not uh, sort of guiding I mean, the, the U.S. environmentalist left. It's true that it's not really there as a term, but it's there as in substance. And I think that might be because the term degrowth, I would argue, is, and I'd be curious your response, is a political loser in the United States. And the, the Green New Deal left pushing for ideas like public luxury, collective consumption, uh, specifically, like in Thea's co-authored book, A Planet to Win, specifically as a way to 
uh, to have society use less resources and less energy conceptually is identical to degrowth, but it's just pushing the idea of abundance, even though it's yeah. like collective and social limits. So I just want to push back. The word, you're saying the word the is word a non-starter, but, non the idea but that I think the substance is powerful. has become more socialized in the US yeah. left. I think that's probably true. I, I think it's true. I hope it's true. Yeah. We try <laughs> to push for it, for sure. Um, and we do try to, and it, it's hard because it's, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one connection or like a um, always an easy one, like you have to make a few steps, but what I was kind of getting at, not very clearly with me talking about pu how public power and democratic ownership of the energy sector might relate to resource use is that um, at, at, in the sort of uh, eco-socialist and worlds that, that Dan's referring to, that Ashley and I have been active in in the US, there is a there's a hypothesis at least, maybe that's a better way to put it, that if we had more public and democratic governance of these sectors of transportation, of housing, of energy, that we could, that we would actually use them in more ecologically and socially rational ways. That there's a connection between who owns the, the sector, that who has power, who has control, who has decision making, and like what the resource footprint is, because we know that the more unequal consumption is, the more resource intensive it is. The more you, and you know, I mean, everyone knows this, but, and there's like more and more research on this. It's astounding, because you can just find more ways to show this in the data on not just carbon footprint, resource footprint, all different ways of cataloging the material impact of consumption, that the more unequal a social structure is, which tends to also be in systems where the consumption's more privatized and individualized, the more the top percentages overconsume, like obscenely. I mean, just like beyond any, like even just like I have, I need 30 yachts. Well, like you can't even be on 30 yachts at once, right? Like this sort of thing. So inequality allows for that for multiple reasons because those at the top feel social license to overconsume. They have political influence on the political system, so then their consumption is underregulated. I mean, we could, we don't have to get into every mechanism, but there's a hypothesis that is a little bit of a a gambit or, or a bet or like it's like not you, it's hard to fully um, say it's true because we haven't experienced it in reality yet. But that like if we democratized and also brought into the public sphere the governance of these sectors, that we could also reduce how much resource the resource footprint and and their inputs and because it would you know we could just design it more rationally on social and ecological grounds. But mm -hmm. I, and that's the I think what you're saying. But it's like. We want that to be the case, and I think it's the case, and there's, there's evidence that the opposite is the case. It's just like, we're not totally sure that expanding NYPA will make the New York State more energy efficient. I mean, maybe, but, but that possibility seems there more than with the IOE, with the investor on the system, at yeah, least. Right, exactly. I don't know. That's my best to do it. But I do think the term is a little hard in, in the US. It works better in French. Anyways, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I feel like I cut us off. We were getting collecting questions. <laughs> yeah. Oh, do you want to add something? Um, yes. Um, but we, we have uh, many dialogues with uh, people from Green New Deal, uh, even with uh, Tia, uh, we met uh, yeah. in this context. Uh, right. And I think that uh, there are many perspectives, but uh, in fact, uh, there are not many connections with the law. I think right. that is the, the question. Not only uh, there, are, there is not a, uh, there is a domestic vision about uh, energy, not uh, in the relation north-south, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a responsibility to think in the geopolitical terms, because the uh, uh, United States is a, is, 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 is a power in the, global, in the global world, you know? So we need, we need to think in the uh, geopolitical terms. And the question of a reduction of consumption, of a change of metabolic profile of society is, is, is the core of the, of, the, of the change, I think, that is a, the question is, is for that I think is, is, is important. Even in the European Green Pact, there are not a reflection about that. No? Even, okay? Uh, and there is a reflection uh, today, I read that uh, there is a reflection about uh, uh, to work less uh, hours in England, in UK, it's uh, news uh, now. But uh, the goal is, 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 is the, the most important thing is uh, dematerialization. Okay, to produce with less energy and raw material. That is the meaning of, um, of um, the, um, the materialization. 
And uh, you know, in, in, in the global south, it's, it, it not only in Latin America, but in, in Africa, when I was uh, last year in Senegal, and I discussed about this topic, people don't want to talk about transition. Because transition, and especially energy transition, is, uh, is, is the same like uh, sharp business, you know? So they don't want to talk about that. They don't want to discuss because it's a false solution. So it's a big problem to, uh, to, to, to how to say that, uh, to, to have a, a more comprehensive, comprehensive discussion about these topics. Because the deception, no, the deception, yes, is, uh, the disappointment, the disappointment of people who find in a territory is the more and more important because now it's not only traditional extractivism, that is the new extractivism in the name of the Gulf of uh, Transition. And that is a, is a very topic, uh, it's a strong topic too, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think just on this last point very briefly is that like what, um, I often get the comment like, well, but in a, in a renewable energy future, so I get this critical comment when I present these things, like in a renewable energy future, we will, the volumes of extraction, of total material extraction will be so much lower mm -hmm. because if you add up all the fossil fuel extraction, coal, gas, oil, and you compare it even to the high forecasts of quote unquote critical minerals, it's higher, okay. But that's a false point because actually what's happening is what Maristello is saying, but just to underscore it, which is that you have multiple regimes of extraction at the same time. That's what's happening in the transition. We have continued fossil fuel extraction. That's not stopping yet. Yeah. I mean, it should, but it's and not. Expansion. And expansion. And expansion. Exactly. exactly, I mean, we just leased a new lease in the US, right? US already number one oil and gas producer in the world. Now we have more oil and gas leases, so under Biden. But anyway, so you have fossil fuel extraction and new critical mineral extraction, and in some places it's near one another, right? Um, and so, you know, again, this is not never to argue against a renewable energy transition, which I'm 100% in favor of, but, but these regimes of extraction are compounding because they're simultaneous, especially in a transition moment, right? And so that's the moment to think about resource, uh, reducing resource intensity, uh, so we don't build out a similar mm -hmm. No, that, that, that's absolutely the case. Um, and, you know, I've been recently looking at um, South Africa, where I was born, but also India, um, where this kind of uh, multiple forms and regimes of extraction is very much the case and is often sort of justified with a kind of nationalist discourse about autonomy and the right to development. So, um, you know, in those contexts, degrowth uh, is even a harder sell. So this is clearly a kind of ideological struggle as, as well as a, a really important political struggle. And those things are interconnected. Um, I think we should probably wind up at this point. Mm -hmm. But um, so uh, of course, you can talk to folks uh, yeah. informally afterwards. But thank you very much for coming. And let's thank our panelists. Thank